Terrence Winter, uh, screenplay writer of the mo the most notorious movie of the year, uh, Wolf of Wall Street. This had to be a blast to write. This you know, what a what a romp, right? I mean, were you just ha were you laughing the whole time having a this was, a yeah? I never had more fun writing anything in my life. I mean. I, uh, from the minute I opened the book, uh, and I read the book in one sitting, which I almost never do, uh, I couldn't put it down. I mean, you know, whenever I adapt something, I, you know, as I'm reading it, I'm circling the things that I think are going to be movie moments, things that have to be in the movie. I circled this entire book, I and mean, this whole thing was pulled. And I mean, the fact that it just dropped in my lap, and I saw the movie in my head as I was reading the book, I couldn't wait to get uh, to my uh, computer to start writing this thing. It was just great. Absolutely a blast. And then what's the process after you do your script, after, even after they okay it, I'm sure you go through many drafts, yeah. uh, I'm leading up to the actual production of the movie, are you permitted on set, <laughs> or, yeah, or is you your know, job done then? The big irony was, you know, Marty, uh, you know, unlike a lot of feature directors I've heard of, is incredibly collaborative and, and, and wants you on set. For me, um, the, the, the problem, if it is, it's the to be on set because I was on set on Boardwalk Empire, the other project I had with Marty. So I was shooting season three of that while we were in production on Wolf. So a lot of the work uh, I did uh, while the movie was sh being shot was done remotely. It was over the phone, over the you know through emails. You know, Marty would email us, we need a line for this, we need some alternate dialogue here, and I would be working that way. I was on set you know three or four times during the course of the shoot. But most of the work had been done in the six weeks prior to production. I met with Marty and Leo every night from like three in the afternoon till two in the morning, and we just went through the script over and over and over again, fine tuning things and uh, just just making sure we were uh, ready to go. Do you invite the uh, actors to give you feedback and suggestions about lines in the course of any of the writing you do? Uh, it's not exactly an invitation, but I'm certainly open to hearing questions and suggestions. I mean, I'm not so sensitive. I'm not one of those writers who has to do it my way. If, they, if I hear a better idea from anybody, and I mean anybody, I will take it. I mean, you know, everybody's got a different perspective. And certainly, a lot of times, these actors know their characters so well, um, they've got some really great insight. So you'd be foolish not to listen and not to consider what's being, uh, what's being discussed. Uh, you know, when we were researching Boardwalk Empire, for example, we were having a discussion about Arnold Rothstein, and it occurred to me that Michael Stuhlbarg, the actor who plays the character, has done more research on Arnold Rothstein than I ever could. So we just invited Michael into the writer's room to tell us everything he knew about Arnold Rothstein, and it saved us a ton of time because he had done so much work, and that's true of pretty much all of them. I'm interested because you know, as a journalist, I have, I've been on many uh, TV and film sets, of course, and seen those inevitable moments where uh, a very famous person will not say the line written by a very celebrated writer like yourself who should not be questioned and uh, nonetheless their egos can't resist and uh, when those inevitable moments happen they're always hilarious to watch from a distance but I wouldn't <laughs> want to be I wouldn't want to be involved in them personally you know <laughs> uh, and, and it, yeah it's a, it's a little it's it can be it can be a little safe. yeah exactly um, this movie uh, is some people say too long, some people say uh, too profane. There, w there was an easy solution to those criticisms if you accept the criticisms, and you may not. And that is just cut out half of those f-bombs, and you've cut the movie in half. <laughs> right. uh, you, you, what, what do you say to the people who say that uh, the f-bomb is used too liberally in the movie? Well, first of all, as far as I'm concerned, there's no such thing as a too long Martin Scorsese movie. Uh, <laughs> Good answer. All right. I will, sit, I will sit all day. When Marty tells me the movie's over, it's over, and, and I'll enjoy every second of it. As far as the language, uh, that's just the reality of how these guys talk. I mean, I'm very comfortable with that language from growing up in New York and, and writing on The Sopranos and Boardwalk Empire. That, that word practically types itself on my final draft program. So to me, it doesn't bump me. And it's real. I mean, it's just the way it talks. I mean, Jordan says it early on in the movie. He says when he got to Wall Street, he couldn't believe how these guys talk to each other. And he goes on to list the things they call each other. So that was really just being faithful to the 
to this to the the reality of the story. The other thing is, it's I he reads stuff like this, and I go, what happened? You know, you had all these great gritty movies in the 1970s. What has happened to us that within 35 years we've become a nation of people uh, who are counting how many f words are used, or that the sensitivity level is so blown out of proportion, in my opinion, that it's just. I don't know. I think we're all adults. I think we can all handle language and nudity and sex and drug use. It's an R-rated movie. Right. And I'm with you on that. I, I buy that answer. But I do accept one common criticism of your movie, and I thought it while watching it, and that was, where are the victims? You yes. know, uh, I want to see the impact of all this reckless selfishness uh, on, on the people that they're perpetrating it on. So why don't we see that perspective? That was... Something we discussed early on in the in the the prospect of going about telling the story, and very much by design, I didn't want to show the people on the other ends of the phone because the movie is about a salesman. I wanted Jordan to sell you his story. He starts off by saying, "Here, here's here. This is who I am. This is the list of drugs that I take." Uh, he's already making him the most unreliable narrator in history. And then he goes on to sell you his life story. And, you know, you're sort of charmed by this guy, and he's funny, and he's crazy, and you're living vicariously through this stuff. And, again, very purposely, you're not seeing the victims of this thing. It's not until the end of the movie when it turns very dark that you start to go, well, oh, wait, I, I, I don't like this guy. He's a jerk. And you kind of realize that you've been sort of the person on the other end of that telephone. He's been selling you a bill of goods. And again, you know, you at that, that point, you take away from this what you will. Uh, you know, the whole idea that this is being, these guys are being glorified, you know, makes me scratch my head. I go, do you really need me to tell you that this is bad behavior, that these are bad guys? It's right there for you. And I want the audience to make up their mind about them without me being didactic and telling them what to think and, you know, showing, you know, the same thing, I wouldn't show Jordan rescuing a puppy from a tree to say, oh, he's actually not a bad guy. So it was just sort of, this is the true, the honest, unvarnished version of his story. You can take away from it what you will and make of him what you will. That was a choice. During the making of the movie, in terms of writing this, a scene or uh, seeing it shot or uh, any of that leading up to it, do you have a favorite scene? I asked Marty this question, and he said yes. In his case, he really had so much fun uh, shooting the scene where Leo's trying to get in the car. He's just bombed out of his brains. He's trying to get out of the country club. And he said that was uh, you know, ex exciting to film because there were there were all, there was all, all kinds of physicality to it. There was all kinds of uh, you know, a lot of elements happening, and he just had a lot of fun filming it. Uh, from your point of view, are there any scenes that you're particularly proud of or you thought were a blast to do? Well, that entire sequence was, you know, just, just a blast to write and, and even more fun to see it come to life. I mean, the sequence from when they start taking the quaaludes to the point at which he rescues Jonah Hill from choking, that entire, I don't know how many minutes long it is, but it is for me one of the most fun pieces I've ever written, you know, envisioning it in my head and then having those expectations exceeded by a thousandfold, watching those, these guys actually commit to it. That I'm really proud of. The, the big speeches, the big speeches that Jordan gives to his, his sales troops, that I'm really proud of too. Those took a, a really long time to get just right and then to just watch Leo take it and just knock it out of the park was just incredibly satisfying as a writer. Uh, Leo spent a lot of time with the real Jordan. Did you get to know him much? I did, yeah. He was, you know, right out of the gate as soon as I was signed on to do this. I met Jordan for lunch. We had many, many dinners together, tons of phone conversations. I'd met his parents. I met his ex-wife, spoke to the FBI agent who arrested him, who, by the way, told me every single thing in that book is true. I said, wow. you got it. He said, I tracked this guy for 10 years. It's all true. Uh, I met people who worked for Jordan. I met people who lost money to Jordan. I just did as much research as I could. At one point, I even had Jordan come into CAA, the talent agency, and recreate one of those big speeches for me. I filled up a conference room with assistants and young agents, and he came in, and he gave a motivational speech that was just incredible to watch. He became the Wolf of Wall Street right in front of my eyes. Do you believe that he's not that wolf anymore? There, There is, when I see him interviewed, like he did the see a, a long interview with Pierce Morgan on CNN that I watched, and uh, I just didn't buy the fact that he's sincere now. I think he regrets some of it, but I still saw a little glint in the eye of that wolf in there. 
Well, I, you know, I, I, you know, based on my many conversations with him, I think if anybody involved in this process would like to turn back the clock and not be that guy, I think Jordan is at the top of that list. Uh, he's always going to be a salesman. I mean, that's what he does. Uh, so I think you're always going to see a little glint in his eye of that guy. You know, he's 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 a salesperson. He is a natural born persuader, and that's what he does. So you know, that's really a question for him. I mean, uh, time will tell. You consistently write about people without a conscience, whether it's the Sopranos or Boardwalk Empire, a lot of gangsters. These guys right. are Wall Street gangsters, of course. Uh, what intrigues you about that personality type? You know, anybody who lives outside the norm, you know, of, of normal society that, that sort of does things that we most people only dream about doing, those are people that are much more interesting to me. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm really one of the most boring people I know. You know, I'm very stable. I go to work. I have two kids. I'm, you know, very conservative in every way. But I've always been fascinated with people who live outside the bounds of, of the law. I mean, because I stuff I would never do. It's sort of like going on a roller coaster. You know, you sort of get to take that ride and kind of experience what it might feel like to be dying, but you don't actually have to die. At the end of it, you unstrap and you get out. But wow, that was exhilarating. Spending time with these characters, whether they're real or fictional, is sort of the same way. You get to kind of walk a mile in those shoes without the consequences, and it's just infinitely more interesting to see people who make choices like that. For me, as a viewer and as a writer, are you a member of the Motion Picture Academy? I am not. I'd like okay. to be though. Are you a member of the uh, TV Academy? I am. Yeah. Uh, so you've seen the uh, peer group award process up close. Uh, you know what I find, what I find absolutely fascinating about this movie entering the Oscar arena is uh, the fact that Hollywood is a den of wolves. I mean, they're the worst of all. No conscience at all. Greedy as anything. And the fact that they are now sitting in judgment of this movie, I'd love right. to get into their head, wouldn't you? That yeah, you know, I never really thought of it that way, but yeah, absolutely, that would be fascinating to see what. How, what people are making of this and, and you know what those people are making of this people who are in the business who are you know certainly understand it's all competition yeah I'd love to I'd love to be privy to the thought process you know Hollywood is um, reluctant to reward people with bad behavior look at the sopranos for example it didn't sure. the best drama series at the Emmys until the fifth year of that show being on the air they finally got around to it but all of us in the media and, and, and around the world had to guilt them into it right <laughs> <laughs> into doing what they should have done anyway and it, it went on to win a second time so they, yeah. they finally gave it its due but uh, I'm not quite sure that Hollywood admits to seeing itself when you put it on a screen that's that's yeah, very possible. I mean, I think, look, anything new certainly takes people a while to sort of accept it and get used to it and, and, and be comfortable with it. I mean, it certainly, Tony Soprano uh, was the first uh, TV lead of his kind. I mean, you know, I don't know if ever in the history of the medium you ever saw your lead on a TV show strangle somebody to death with his bare hands. That took a little getting used to for people. And I think, you know, in general, uh, you know, characters who are not inherent apparently likable or rootable for, or, you know, you can automatically get behind, I guess maybe it takes a little more, but, um, you know, for me, not necessarily, I mean, I, I, I recognized right away that Jake LaMotta, for example, was a horrible person, but, you know, looking at that performance and looking at the courage and the commitment it took to, to make that film, I mean, I was, you know, right away said, God, this is one of the greatest things I've ever seen, so I guess it's all in the eye of the beholder. Okay, well, uh, good luck to you at the Oscars, Terrence. You certainly Thank deserve you. that Oscar, and uh, I'm rooting for for you as the wolf uh, to be the wolf of Oscar night. Thank you very much. I feel like I already won. Just being able to do this movie with Marty and Leo, just saying I wrote a Martin Scorsese movie, everything after that is gravy. It's all good. <laughs> That's the spirit. All right, thanks so much. Thank Bye -bye. you.